Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, welcome to this week's installment of Tasting Together. My name's Pat Fahey. I'm the content director for the Cicerone Certification Program. I'm also a master Cicerone and I'd like to thank you all for joining me to talk about We Heavy. So each week with Tasting Together, we like to come together, preferably with beer in hand, to discuss some topic from the canon of different beer-related topics. Thus far, we've mostly stuck with beer styles, but we're going to start branching out a little bit in the near future. Um, one of the things I always like to say up front, uh, if you haven't been here before, Feel free to ask questions as we're going through. Uh, I've got somebody who aggregates questions for me, so I'll do my absolute best to make sure I address any of the questions that come in as we're going. If you have been here before, or if you're joining us again from last week, thanks for coming back. Uh, last week we covered wit beer, which was a lot of fun. It's a favorite style of mine. Uh, I drank some Allagash White and then continued to drink Allagash White throughout the week, and it was a good week as a result. So. Before we get started, um, I always like to go over what we've got coming up in the upcoming weeks. Next week, we've got a really fun one lined up. We're going to be doing our first ever beer and food pairing in one of these sessions. We're going to be doing the sort of classic pairing of American IPA and blue cheese. So between now and next week, go out and pick up a wedge of either your favorite blue cheese, or if you don't have a favorite, pick one or ask somebody for a recommendation there. Or if you don't like blue cheese, maybe don't buy a whole ton of it, but I, it's such an interesting and exciting pairing. I think even for people that don't love blue cheese, I've, I've seen people turned on to blue cheese just with that pairing. So uh, grab that, grab whatever American IPA you want to go with. And, and that's what we'll be talking about next week. The week after that, we'll be doing uh, Weissbier, traditional German Hefeweizen or German Weissbier. And then we haven't announced any of the weeks after that. I'll probably be making some decisions on what we want to be doing in the month of July between this week and next week. So feel free in the comments right now if anybody has any styles that they'd like to see talked about or, or if anybody has any kind of lingering questions that they think we could spin up into one of these, I'm always on the lookout for new topics to cover. And I see, and normally I wait until the end to take questions, but since this is really relevant to what we're talking about now, um, asking about whether or not you should do a standard American IPA, versus doing like a New England IPA or something else. I would go with kind of a classic American IPA for this, something that is not necessarily hazy, that does have a significant amount of bitterness. If you want to grab a New England IPA to try alongside as well, absolutely go for it. That'll only make for a more interesting tasting. But in general, in terms of trying to, at least for this first one, make sure we put together a pairing that works pretty well. I've definitely had a lot more success lining up uh, blue cheese against uh, more standard American IPA versus trying to do something like a New England IPA. Uh, but yeah, by all means, if you want to try both, I'm not going to stop you. It'll, it'll only be more enriching of a tasting for you. So without further ado, let's jump right in and start talking about We Heavy. So uh, this week we're doing We Heavy, sometimes known as Strong Scotch Ale. I saw somebody is drinking the same thing that I am. Um, I, ha I have Oscar Blue's Old Chub. Uh, normally I would probably try to go with something that was like a classic example from country of origin, but Scotch Ales or We Heavies can be a bit harder to find sometimes. And I didn't have a uh, chance to go shop around too much. And this is definitely a credible example of the style. So uh, if you haven't said already, 
give a shout out what you're tasting? I'd love to hear. In terms of glassware, uh, I'm going with my standard tulip, which I go with a lot. Uh, you'll sometimes see both like lower alcohol Scottish ales and then also we have a sometimes served in what's referred to as a thistle glass. They have the Scotch ale book and there's a picture of the thistle glass. It's shaped like a thistle flower, which is the national flower of Scotland. I'm not sure. Well, I, you know, well, that glass shape is sometimes associated with these styles. I don't think you actually see that much of glasses shaped that way in Scotland. Um, it's a little bit like more of a kitschy thing and not necessarily something you see all the time. Uh, in terms of glass that I would ideally serve this style in. Since it's a bit higher in alcohol, I probably am going to opt for something that's stemmed and a little bit smaller in volume. Uh, um, something like a tulip or even a snifter can be really nice for a presentation of this style. So talk a little bit about the background of We Heavy. And I want to talk not just about We Heavy at first, but just kind of about Scottish styles more broadly. When you look at uh, the way that BJCP classifies Scottish beer styles, there are four styles that they recognize. There's sort of the three lower alcohol Scottish styles, which are Scottish light, Scottish heavy, and Scottish export. And then you have uh, We Heavy on top of the, of the pyramid as kind of this very strong version of Scottish style beer. And while they didn't necessarily all evolve in the same way, at this point, they all kind of have similar flavor characteristics and relatively similar formulations. Just We Heavy happens to be a lot stronger than the other ones. Um, one of the things that's interesting about these styles is that they're all very malt dominated. In fact, hops do not play much of a role in any of these classic Scottish styles. And one of the things that I remember hearing when I, when I learned about Scottish beers at first was that Scottish brewers didn't really use hops in their beer very much for a few reasons. Firstly, because, because of how far north Scotland is, hops don't grow there very well. And that is true. Hops do not grow in Scotland very well. But, you know, if you know anything about the UK or the history of Scotland and England, there's been some friction there for much of their history. And so the story went as, as I'd heard it at least that because the Scots didn't necessarily want to be having to import a lot of ingredients from the English that they sort of avoided using hops, which they would have had to purchase from the English. That's not entirely true. Uh, if you look back at like breweries in Glasgow and Edinburgh, like in the 1800s and 1900s, there was a fair amount of uh, more hop forward beer, pale ale type styles being produced, even some IPAs. Um, a lot of that beer was being produced for export, but some of it was being consumed domestically as well. So there definitely was a fair amount of brewing of, of rather hoppy beers, um, just for whatever reason at this point, the styles that have survived and are considered sort of somewhat indigenous to Scotland are these really malt forward beer styles. Now, when you look at those different Scottish styles, um, they kind of map out similarly to like a like maltier versions of classic British bitters. So, you know, when you look at British bitters, there are three different categories that increase in terms of alcoholic strength and overall intensity going from ordinary bitter to uh, best bitter to strong bitter as you sort of move up in terms of level of alcohol and, and overall amount of flavor. Same sort of thing, and the alcohol contents map out in a roughly similar way. I think uh, 
light, Scottish light actually ends up being even a little lighter than an ordinary bitter. It's allowed to go all the way down, I think, to two and a half percent alcohol. Um, but then up through heavy and then export, export being the strongest of those light ones, which still tops out at around 6% alcohol. And those, as far as I know, kind of evolved as a group. We Heavy is thought to be a descendant of sort of these strong ale styles that were very prominent and popular in England and in Scotland in the 1700s and 1800s. Um, probably similar to the sort of historic Burton Ale, which I believe is thought to have given rise to barley wine down the line. So another little historical oddity um, tied to Scottish styles. I've seen some people kind of throwing stuff about this or talking about this in the comments is the, uh, the shilling ratings that you see given to styles. So prior to, in the most recent update of the BJCP guidelines, they did away with the with the shilling ratings, and I'm going to just type it in really quick here. When you see a uh, number followed by a slash hyphen, thanks, Shana. The slash hyphen is shilling. So, like that top comment there would be read as sixty shilling, um, and it, it referred to the price of a barrel of that beer. So. BJCP used to have shilling names associated with at least the three lower alcohol Scottish styles. Scottish light was referred to as 60 shilling. Scottish heavy was referred to as 70 shilling. Scottish export was referred to as 80 shilling. And then strong Scotch ale or we heavy didn't have a BJCP name attached to it, but you know, you might see beers anywhere from 90 shilling up to 120 shilling falling into that sort of strong Scotch ale or we heavy category. Now, BJCP dropped that naming in the most recent update, and there are a few reasons why they did that. One, the shilling naming convention was not tied to these beers specifically. Uh, so it was really just used as the price of a barrel of that beer. So you could have a 60 shilling stout or a 70 shilling pale ale or an 80 shilling IPA. So there's nothing inherent about these multi Scottish styles that uh, would make that shilling designation be related only to them. The other reason though that they dropped it was that like they, those terms were never used in Scotland as like a general style category because it, it really came down to the exact pricing. So you could see like a 54 shilling pale ale or a 78 shilling stout. And so uh, while those shilling numbers did correspond to, you know, the, the strength of the beer, they never were really used explicitly to discuss styles. And so we don't use them anymore, or BJCP at least does not use them anymore to label or codify any of the Scottish styles. That said, there is like an amount of romanticism behind this, this shilling labeling style. So you do still see some brands of beer using it in the names of their specific brands. Uh, the one from Scotland that comes to mind is Bellhaven's Wee Heavy, which used to just say Bellhaven Wee Heavy, but underwent uh, rebranding sometime in the last, I don't know, two to four years, I would say. And now the packaging and, and the bottle labels say Bellhaven Wee Heavy and, and 90 shilling as well is on there on the label. So more than you ever thought you wanted to know about Scottish shilling designations. So I wanna talk a little bit about how this beer is made. And one of the things that's, um, you know, th this is a beer that by and large is, is dominated by malt character. Uh, but in addition, it, it's not just about the grist. It's also about the way that the beer is typically made. There are some uh, 
unique aspects of the production that give it uh, a special set of characteristics. So first, just to talk through ingredients. These days, the grist is usually going to be a base of pale ale malt, and then some amount of roasted barley for color and flavor. A lot of breweries today are also going to use some other character malts, like maybe various crystal malts to give some sweetness and some, some color to the beer. Uh, but that is not necessarily traditional, or that's not at least historically how these beers would have been made. We'll talk a little bit later when we talk about production methods about how breweries would have achieved additional color and additional sweetness without the use of things like crystal malts. Um, from a hopping perspective, there's virtually no hop flavor or aroma. There's usually just enough bitterness to balance out the significant amount of sweet, and it doesn't even really balance out. These beers are pretty sweet. Um, so on the whole, hopping is low. There's usually low to maybe moderate bitterness present. Hop varieties probably uh, classic English varietals like Fuggle or EKG. When you look at fermentation, fermentation is going to be with uh, some sort of ale yeast. However, you know, fermentations historically would have been conducted at ambient temperature. Ambient temperature in Scotland is a little bit cooler than it is in a lot of other places. And so as a result, these beers typically don't have a lot in the way of fermentation character. You usually don't see as much uh, ester production as you might see in, in other styles made in the UK. Um, and so at this point when other people are trying to replicate those styles, when people in the U S are, are making wee heavies or other Scottish styles, they're usually going to use a slightly lower fermentation temperature in order to mimic that lower level of ester character that you get. So let's talk a little bit about production methods that, that make this interesting. Um, and some of this gets a little bit technical, but I'll, I'll do my best to kind of put it out there in a way that's not, not too technical. So first of all, uh, mashing is typically going to be conducted with a sacrification rest at a rather high temperature. When you look at mashing, mashing is the step where we're mixing ground malt with hot water and holding it at a either several different temperatures or at least holding it once at a temperature in the sacrification range, the range in which malt enzymes are going to be able to break malt starches down into sugar. Now there's a pretty wide range that can get used for that portion anywhere, you know, most often it's going to be right around 150 degrees Fahrenheit, but it can go a bit lower down to maybe like 145 degrees Fahrenheit, or it can go up significantly higher to maybe 158 degrees Fahrenheit. And while that may not sound like a lot, those little changes make a big difference in terms of the characteristics of the finished beer. Uh, a lower sacrification temperature rest, something in the high 140s, is going to give you a much more fermentable wort. So that means that you're going to have higher level of attenuation, less residual sugar, lighter body, all of the things that come with a higher ferment, a, a more fermentable wort. On the flip side, um, mashing at a, or having a sacrification rest at a higher temperature, maybe in the mid to upper 150s, is going to give you a higher proportion of unfermentable sugars in your wort. And so that's going to lead to more residual sugar in the finished beer, more body, all those sorts of things. We heavies typically are mashed at a, and undergo a pretty high sacrification rest, um, usually up around 158 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 70 degrees Celsius. And so because of that, you end up with this wort that is not super fermentable, and that's one of the things that contributes to these beers typically being so rich and full in body and having so much residual sugar. It doesn't necessarily have to do with, it has less to do with like the brewer stopping the fermentation before it's complete and more to do with 
what the brewer is doing uh, on the hot side to produce a wort that is going to end up with a lot of residual sugar and a lot of body when it's finished. So that's one thing that's done on the process side that is unique and important to producing this type of beer. The other thing that's, uh, that sort of contributed to how these beers were traditionally made that would have developed a lot of flavor and them has to do with another, I guess it's not, it's louder, it's related to loudering rather than mashing, but a loudering technique known as sparging. Um, so if you're familiar with the brewing process or if you're not, I'll try to try to give it to you as easily as I can and then slowly get more technical until your brain melts. But um, when mashing is finished, the brewer then moves in or the beer then moves into loudering stage where basically the brewer is draining the sugary liquid, the wort off of the spent grains to transfer it over to the boil kettle. And today in typically, in virtually like every brewery all over the world, um, once the liquid starts to be drawn off, the brewer is then going to begin sparging which is the process of basically sprinkling hot water over the, over the grain bed to draw out additional sugars. If you just were to draw all of the liquid off, you would leave a lot of sugar and flavor content and, base, and you know, you'd reduce the efficiency of your brewing process by leaving behind all of that sugar. That sugar coming from the malt, that's, that's money basically. Brewers don't wanna just leave money behind in their, in their spent grain. And so what brewers do is they sparge the beer. They add the hot water to dissolve additional sugars and draw them off of the grain. Sparging was developed in Scotland. This is a process that was first used by Scottish brewers. At the, you know, around the time, uh, brewers elsewhere similarly did not want to waste the sugar left in their grain bed. But what was more traditional in the UK would have been to just initiate a second mash to mix water in again and undergo kind of like a similar set of temperature rests and then draw the liquid off. The Scottish developed this process of sparging, which today is used all over the world, but the what it resulted in in the way that they were doing it was they would end up with a wort that was a lot more dilute than what they wanted for fermentation. And as is the case in with other brewing techniques that leave you with a, a lower strength wort than you want going into fermentation, the way that they get the strength that they want is they boil it for a long time. So rather than a traditional 60 to 90 minute boil, they might be boiling it for a few hours to drive off more water, leaving them with a more concentrated wort, which ultimately will give them a stronger beer. What you get with this longer boil is you also get development of color and flavor, especially if, as was traditional in, in Scottish breweries, historically, you're using like a direct fired kettle where you were firing it with kettles or you were heating it with fire instead of with steam. So all of that said, because they sparged these beers and because they had to boil them for a long time, they were able to develop a lot of additional color and sort of caramel toffee flavor just from this really extended boil rather than having to use things like crystal malts. Today, when brewers are producing these beers, uh, you know, sparging is, uh, as I've said, it's like a locked in technique that brewers use for virtually all of their beers. Brewers can do it without producing a wort that is way too dilute for what they want out of their finished wort. And so, rather than having to go through the trouble of doing a multi-hour boil, brewers can achieve or replicate some of those flavors by their selection of grains like crystal malts and other sorts of things. But traditionally, this beer would have been primarily just pale ale malt, uh, like roasted barley for color and some flavor. And then that long extended boil contributing sweetness and additional color to the beer. That was more than I intended to discuss about 
sparging and kettle caramelization, but <laughs> cheers. So let's talk about the flavor profile of this beer. And I will talk primarily about the one in front of me, but I'll also address we heavies more widely. Um, as I've talked about throughout this, like this is a malty beer. This is a malt forward beer and it hits on so many different notes of like dark malt flavor and character. There's, you know, there's a bit of like brown bread pumpernickel, but there's also a lot of like uh, brown sugar, molasses, caramel, toffee type notes. Um, there's some dark fruit character, like stewed prune, raisin, a little bit of like figgy date kind of character as well. It's also kind of nutty. There's like a candied pecan or pecan shell note to it. And then also, you know, it's not like, at least this one, and, and in general, they're not like really heavily roasted. You're not typically going to see like espresso or like burnt coffee ground kind of notes out of it, but there's definitely some chocolate, some milk chocolate, and maybe a little bit of like a, like a dark chocolate or a cocoa powder kind of note in this beer. From a outside of the malt, I don't pick up any hot flavor aroma. Um, there's usually, uh, sometimes you'll get a little bit of yeast character. I'm not really picking up any here. Um, outside of all that malt character, I mean, the other really important characteristics I think to note in this beer are taste and mouthfeel characteristics. So given the relatively high finishing gravity and the lower level of attenuation, once again, in part driven by that higher mash temperature, um, you get a fair amount of sweetness in this beer. The, we have a, in the grand scheme of, of different beer styles is one of the more perceivably sweet styles of beer. Um, also pretty full in body. Uh, and sometimes you'll get a little bit of alcohol warmth on these ones. This one has just a little bit, I would say anecdotally, like based on my own experience, I typically don't see alcohol warmth or won't perceive alcohol warmth personally in a beer that's less than maybe 7% alcohol. And that's the point at which I feel like you start to pick up on some of that warmth and then it really becomes more pronounced when you get to like nine or 10% alcohol or, or beyond. Um, this one has just a little bit, I think this one is 8% alcohol. So just a little bit of, of alcohol warmth to it. One other thing I forgot to say uh, when I was talking about ingredients that I do want to talk about. Um, you know, we talked about the grist. It is pale malt, roasted barley, maybe some crystal malt. One thing that it is not is it is not made with peated barley malt. And that is a misconception that some people have. Um, peated malt, if you're not familiar, is what gives peated scotch. It's kind of like very intense flavor characteristics. And not all scotch has those really intense flavor characteristics. It, you know, if I were to describe peat character some people describe it as kind of like medicinal, phenolic. It's, it's kind of a rough, smoky character. And, and one of the reasons why like peat smoked malt can even work at all in scotch is because that will have years to mellow in, in oak barrels. Um, peated malt doesn't work super well in beer. I've had if used in beer, it has to be used very judiciously. And even then it's, it's usually not great. Um, just cause it's such an intense flavor. Uh, and so at least within Scotland use of peated malt is confined only to Scotch whiskey. And even then only production of certain Scotch whiskeys. 
Um, when, if you pick up smoky characteristics in these beers, usually it's going to be the result of the roasted malt um, or roasted barley. That's one thing I think I talked about when we talked about Irish stout a month or two ago uh, is that sometimes roasted barley can sort of mimic uh, a lightly smoky characteristic. I know Old Chubb does actually use a very small amount of, of beechwood smoked malt. So typically like the kind of malt that you would use to make uh, Rauch beer, a traditional German Rauch beer. Um, but I remember, and I could be wrong in this, but I have a recollection of like talking to somebody from Oscar Blues about the use of, of beechwood smoked malt in this beer years ago. And they're like, it, like half a percent of the grist or maybe 1% of the grist. So it's just like a kiss of smoke. If, if even perceptible at all, it's, it, it adds a bit of complexity to the malt profile, but it doesn't stand out as like overtly smoky. So finish up, talk a little bit about uh, We Heavy Pairing. A lot of the styles that we've talked about in recent weeks have been like really drinkable, crushable, quaffable type styles of beer. Uh, this, at least in my book, does not qualify in that realm. And one of the things that's nice about pairing with those kinds of beers is that in a lot of cases, it's a, it's going to be a more delicate beer. And so it can work with things where it will actually sync up nicely with a lighter dish, but even with a heavier dish, it can just act as a refresher. This beer does not have those qualities. Um, some of the lighter Scottish beers are actually easier to pair in more situations, I would say, because they have uh, kind of, they have those malt characteristics that line up well with a lot of foods, but they're still rather dry and they're, and they're low enough in alcohol and sweetness that they're still somewhat refreshing. This is not a terribly refreshing beer. And so it's really kind of limited to just matching up against things that are pretty rich. I think We Heavy is a great companion to a lot of different uh, meats, like especially any kind of sausage, pork, anything that's developed a lot of like Maillard, like roasted or caramelized character. Um, things like duck, or you go a little bit gamier into like lamb and venison. Those can all work really nicely with something like We Heavy. Uh, you know, I, I can think of a time of like enjoying this with like a really rich cassoulet kind of dish like a or like duck confit where in all honesty like i would prefer to have something like that with something that had a little bit of cutting power like a like the car high carbonation in a belgian double or or the acidity that you'd find in a flanders red but like if you're like cold winter night you're leaning all in on just like gut bomb comfort food like something super rich like that or like meatloaf and we heavy, I'd do it. And, and it would be good. You would enjoy it. Um, we heavy can also work pretty well in dessert pairings. One of the things that can be tough about dessert pairing, this is true with, you know, this is why when you look at dessert wines, dessert wines are typically very sweet. Um, one of the reasons why that is the case, why traditionally very sweet wines are paired with dessert is because when you take a food item that is sweet and you pit it up against something that is not sweet, it makes the beverage taste kind of like harsh or unpleasant. And that can happen in pairing with, uh, with beer as well with certain desserts, where if you have a dessert that's very sweet, you pit it up against a beer that doesn't have a lot of or any sweetness to it, uh, it can make the beer taste harsh and unpleasant. We Heavy has a lot of sweetness to it. And so it, it can work in, in a lot of dessert cases where other things might not be able to. I think probably two of my favorite applications would be either with, um, with certain chocolate desserts where kind of like the dark fruit notes and all of that like caramel brown sugar can play really nicely off of, off of something that features chocolate 
or creme brulee is another pretty classic pairing with this where you have kind of that like caramelized crust and then the vanilla notes of creme brulee that just tend to sync up really well with the similar flavors that are found in this beer. So. Cheers. And on that note, let's take a look at questions. So first question comes from Kevin Meyer and that's, can you compare We Heavy with a quad or a Doppelbach? That's a great question. Um, in particular, because at the certified level and at the advanced level, like that's a pretty common comparison that we might make you do on a tasting exam, like We Heavy versus, you got Belgian quad on here, like which is Belgian dark strong. It's the style name we'd use, um, but we'll do We Heavy against Belgian Dark Strong, We Heavy against Belgian Double, um, We Heavy against Doppelbach. So I'll take those kind of individually. Um, first, when you're looking about at We Heavy versus a Belgian Double, Belgian Dark Strong, um, there are a few key differences. One, you're gonna expect more yeast character out of the Belgian beers. Um, in particular, you might expect some phenolic character, like a little bit of like black pepper or clove, which you would not expect to see in this beer. Um, so that's one core difference. The one that actually stands out more to me, though, because there is like a lot of dark fruit character present in these beers. And, and so there can served blind. There's more overlap between these styles than you would potentially think. Um, Mouthfeel traits are, are the really big difference for me when it comes to those styles, where you would expect both the Belgian double and a Belgian dark strong to be a little bit lighter in body and very high in carbonation, whereas this is typically going to be moderate in carbonation and pretty full and, and rich in body. Similarly, sweetness level. Um, this is a pretty high level of residual sugar. Belgian double, Belgian dark strong should not have very much in the way of residual sugar. And one of the things that's kind of confusing on those beers is that they have all of this fruit character and oftentimes a lot of similar like brown sugar sorts of notes that smell or, or give you the impression of sweetness. So if you're in like a taste test scenario, one of the things that I will recommend to people that they do is like take a sip of the beer and plug your nose because while your nose is unplugged, you are constantly smelling what is in your mouth. And those aromas interfere with your ability to reliably assess what sort what the levels of different tastes are. So all of those, and I've done this with students with uh, like Belgian double a million times where I'll have them taste the beer plug their nose. When you taste it, it's not perceivably sweet. As soon as you let go of your nose, you get aromas of prune and fig and uh, brown sugar and molasses and caramel. And, and even knowing that there's very little residual sugar, as soon as you unplug your nose, you're like, oh wait, no, it is sweet. But it's, it's not. The beer is not sweet. There's not very much sugar there. It's just those aromas tricking you into thinking that the beer is sweet. So one of the big differences between the two is that this one does actually have a lot of residual sugar to it. If you do the plug nose test, you should be able to perceive that on your tongue. Um, so that's a huge difference there. With Doppelbach, um, Doppelbach I would say is a little bit tougher in part because you know Doppelbach is a lager, so you don't expect a lot in the way of uh, fermentation character in this, even though it's an ale, you don't expect a lot of fermentation character in it. Um, I would say that Doppelbach tends to skew more towards kind of like bready, toasty, pretzel, nutty malt characteristics, whereas this is more kind of caramel, toffee, uh, brown sugar malt characteristics. That's probably a, uh, the big differentiating feature for me there. But uh, Doppelbach versus We Heavy is honestly a pretty tough distinction. So, let's see. 
So Greg asks, rather than boiling longer to increase the OG, why not try a decoction process? So decoction doesn't necessarily increase original gravity that much. Um, you know, decoction originally evolved as a way to get better extraction of sugars from under modified grains. And typically this is gonna be made with like a well-modified uh, pale ale malt. Also with decoction, while you're boiling during the decoction, you're not boiling it for long enough to cook off a lot of liquid. Um, boiling is a pretty common technique for locking in target original gravity. Uh, you know, when brewers formulate their recipes, any recipe that they make, um, they account for a certain amount of evaporation during their regulation length boil. So, you know, if the brewer wanted their beer to be at like 16 plate, I, I don't know the exact numbers. I have to sit down and do some calculations, but like if they wanted to be at 16 degrees Plato going into the fermenter, they might have to target a, uh, 14 degree Play-Doh when they have all of, when they've like finished laudering into the kettle, depending upon the geometry of the, uh, of the kettle and how long the boil is going to go, they're going to lose some amount of liquid there. They're going to end up with a more concentrated wort. So that's another tactic that's used in, um, you know, pro production of Lambic beer where you have, uh, this mashing method, turbid mashing, that gives you way more liquid than you want. You end up with a much lower strength wort than you would want to ferment with. And so that's one of the reasons why boils are so, so long in production of lambic wort. So, uh, so yeah, boiling is probably the number one technique that is used when it's like, oh, our word is weaker than we want it to be. We'll just boil it longer so that we have less water. Uh, Reese asks for key differences between we heavy and English barley wine. Biggest thing I'd probably cite would be, well, there are a couple things. One thing is gonna be the hopping. English barley wines are nowhere near as bitter as American barley wines, but they're still a lot more bitter than this is. If I remember right, I think the bitterness specs are like 35 to 65 IBUs or 35 to 75, or I'm just like making up numbers right now. Shana could check for me if she wants. Um, but for, I, I wanna say IBUs on this are somewhere in like the 17 to 35 range. And for English barley wine, it's, it starts around 35 and goes up as far as like the 70s or so. So you've got a lot more bitterness. You have the possibility for some hop flavor and aroma. The other big difference though is in the 35 to 70. All right. I, I took the, my last cistern exam a very long time ago. And well, a lot of those numbers are still kind of bouncing around up there. They're, they're not quite as like hard and fast and dead on as they maybe once were. Um, but uh, so bitterness is one big difference. The other big difference is going to be in the grist. And that's in part, one of the things that's really cool about barley wine is it's basically the extension of the British bitter letter. It's typically like it traditionally doesn't see the use of very much or even any uh, specialty malt. It's usually all like a pale ale malt or like in the case of like a traditional English barley wine, maybe all Maris Otter malt. Um, and the thing is, is that it achieves kind of that darker amber color just because you're using so much malt to produce it versus this beer where it is gonna get some amount of roasted barley for color adjustment and flavor adjustment. And so um, 
the flavor is is an, the the malt flavor is another place where you see differences. You don't see typically chocolate flavors, or even uh, you might see all the way up to like some light nuttiness, but you don't see any darker roasted malt flavors in in a traditional English barley wine. Usually, you're going to see a lot more kind of caramel and toffee type of flavors. So that's uh, those are probably the two most prominent things that I would cite between those two styles. There might be more, but let's see. What else do we have? Got a question. What is the difference between We Heavy and the... I don't even want to try and pronounce this. The Froch Heather Ale, F R A O C H. Um, I'm trying to remember that beer. That's a specific brand name on that beer, and I'm trying to remember who produces it. But, um, but that beer, to my knowledge, is is not a Wee Heavy. Wee Heavy is once again, or you know, the super malt forward beer made with standard beer ingredients. One of the things that makes that beer unique is that it is made with Heather, uh, which is, I'm not sure if Heather is considered like an herb or a grass or what it is. It has kind of like a, it, it, it gives the beer kind of like a honey nut Cheerio sort of flavor and aroma. Heather grows all over Scotland and, and it's a flower. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take that. Um, and uh, as I was kind of talking about early on, especially when you dig back to like really historic production. So we're talking 500,000 years ago production of beer in Scotland, um, where they would have just been using ingredients local to the area and they did not have access to hops. They used other herbs, spices, flowers that were available in the area. One of which was, uh, Heather. So um, Heather is one of the things that flavors that beer. It's, it's a, I haven't had that beer in years, but it's very different than a, uh, than a Wee Heavy. Let's see, Steven asks, my Bellhaven has a bit of an ashy finish. Is that from the long boil? I would imagine not. I wouldn't expect a long boil to produce any ashy sorts of characteristics. Um, that to me sounds more like a product of use of dark malt. And I'm sure that there's some, probably some amount of, of roasted barley that goes into that beer, which is going to give it, once again, it's darker color, but also potentially some of those flavors that could trend towards like an ashiness. Let's see. Andrew asked, do you know if Scottish brewers traditionally added extra specialty malt to the mash after each running, or is it purely extended boiling that adds the complexity of second, third runnings? Um, the short answer is I don't know for sure. Uh, but from what I do know, I don't think that's the case. Um, my understanding is that uh, they would have been using a combination of pale malt and roasted malt and maybe a little bit of like brown malt, which was at like brown malt, like would have been used in historic porter brewing, which was produced in a way that gave it some characteristics that were a little bit akin to crystal malt. Um, but no, they certainly weren't as far as I know, like adding additional malt, uh, and at least, and I could be wrong on this. I'm not like well versed in in the origins of sparging and how it was conducted historically versus how it was conducted today. But at least the way that sparging is conducted today, it's not really separate runnings. You, they don't pull like a first runnings or second runnings like you do in in some other methods of brewing, like partigal mashing, which was another historic mashing technique. Uh, it's more that the way that loudering works is you begin pulling the wort off and first you recirculate the wort through the grain bed to kind of help uh, settle the grain bed and, and have it serve as a filter. And once the wort 
that's coming off of the louder is clear, then you start running it to the kettle. Then the way that sparging works is that once the level of liquid gets close to the top of the of the grain, that's typically when sparging begins. So it's it's a continuous process. You don't have like a distinct first runnings and a second runnings. Like I said, I'm not sure if that's just how it's done today and historic Scottish sparging had multiple phases, but uh, but yeah, to my knowledge, there was nothing like that where they're adding additional malt. You do pick up a fair amount of flavor and character from that really extended boil. Let's see. So somebody asked, I can imagine on the tasting part of the exam that differentiating between a wee heavy and a doppelbach is hard. Is a discernible difference the perceived hops? Uh, I would say not really. Um, I don't know about the wee heavy that you're having, but this one doesn't have, really have any hop character to speak of. Um, Doppel box typically typically going to be the same. Not really much hop flavor or aroma to speak of. Bitterness on both of them is pretty low. Uh, like I said, we have a doppel box is one that's pretty tough. And I and I, it's possible that we don't actually use that one at CC. Though I could be totally lying there. That's definitely one that could show up on the advanced exam, but. Um, uh, significantly more common on the certified exam would be like Doppelbach versus Belgian double or we heavy versus Belgian double. Kristen asks in the BJCP guidelines, this style is listed as dextrinous. What does this refer to? Um, so dextrins are another name for like longer chain sugars or like starch that's not broken down all of the way. So when I talked earlier about you know, higher mash temp, you're producing a wort that is less fermentable. Another way to describe that would be a wort that is more dextrinous. It has a higher proportion of those longer chain sugars that yeast is not going to be able to ferment. And I think I saw Max in the comments, I just like saw something about dextrose go by while I was talking. Important to note that that is very different from dextrose. Dextrose is another name for glucose, which is a very simple sugar and is very highly fermentable. So dextrins or dextrinous describes a less fermentable wort, one that is going to end up, and also a less fermentable beer, one that's going to end up with a higher proportion of, uh, of residual sugar in the finished beer and consequently higher body. Let's see. Kristen also asks, what are the effects of aging on this kind of beer? Um, this is a beer that would hold up to aging, at least in the short term, reasonably well. Uh, you know, over time, when I think about like the things that happen as beer ages, hop flavor and aroma dies off. Okay, there isn't really much of that to speak of. Uh, malt flavor begins to shift. You'd probably see sort of a deepening of the caramel and toffee notes and maybe development of more dark fruit characters. So the beer may actually get more robust in some of those characteristics. Um, but then over time might lose a little bit of its, of its life or liveliness. So it's certainly a style that could be aged for some time. I've said it before on here, like, at this point in my life, I try to avoid aging beer because in general, I just age it too long and then it sucks. And you could certainly age this beer too long. But if you're curious and you bought more than one, let one of them age for six months. And last but not least, and I did mean to address this, uh, Andrew asked, why is it called a wee heavy? And one of the reasons I forgot to like directly address this is because I don't really know. I've never seen a good explanation for this. I've like in prepping for this today, I saw one explanation that was like, it's high in alcohol. So it's served in like wee portions, which maybe, maybe not. Um, 
heavy is a tough one because you look at the term like Scottish heavy, the style Scottish heavy, heavy strikes you as a word that should mean like strong. I think that beer is like 3.2 to 3.9% alcohol. So that's clearly not the case. Um, so I'm not hundred percent sure where the name we heavy comes from. Um, uh, yeah, I've always thought it was something that probably like sounds really funny when like somebody says it. So it's like, cool, let's go with that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a name that's been attached to this style for a, a very long time. And that's, uh, that's as much as I can say definitively about it. So I'm sorry that I don't have a better answer on that. If anybody like knows or is able to, to dig something up about it, I would be happy to have a better explanation of that, but, uh, but I don't. So, and I think that that is a great place to close. Uh, I want to thank you guys all for coming and talking. We heavy Ron Pattinson would be a good person to ask. He might actually know. Um, if I, if I see him, if we're ever allowed to go and meet with people in public again, the next time I see him, I will be sure to ask him. Uh, and last but not least, uh, come join me for American IPA and blue cheese and double last max. Uh, saw Max doing a good job answering questions in the, uh, in the chat today. So Max, this one specifically is for you. I don't have anyone here today to bring me a shot glass. So this is just going to be straight up. You guys are, are wonderful. Uh, have a great Wednesday. And if you've never tried to drink the Lord straight from the bottle, I will, I will say that it is significantly worse in that format. Thank you all. I uh, hope you have a great week, and I hope to see you next week for some IPA and blue cheese. Cheers.